Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation and Development here at the RSA, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's RSA Thursday event. Before we can begin, can I ask you to turn your mobiles onto silent? And today's hashtag is, for if you're going to be operating on Twitter, RSA Pirate, which is probably the best one we've ever had. Um, but do jo join the lively discussion on, discussion on Twitter. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome today's speaker, Sam Conniff Allende. Sam is the founder and CEO of Liberty. Liberty, I knew I was going to say that wrong. Liberty. Liberty, um, and a, a multi-award winning youth marketing agency, um, which he has now moved on from and is now, I think I'm going to call you the godfather of rebellion, you know, actually inspiring people around the world to become more pirate. Before this, he was work he's worked extensively with Google, Unilever, PlayStation, Red Bull and Dyson and runs his unique Be More Pirate workshops and talks at these industry leading companies. He's joining us today to explain how we can harness the innovative spirit of the golden age pirates and create genuine personal and social good as a result. At the moment, I'm reading Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, and I am quite taken with Grace O'Malley. So I'm going to be channeling Grace O'Malley when we have our conversation later. Um, but please give me a big, uh, join me in a big welcome to Sam Conniff Allende. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Grace O'Malley is indeed a good pirate, um, but I'm often asked who my favourite pirate is, and it's a pirate called Anne Bonny. Uh, not a very well-known pirate, but easily one of the most fearsome and fantastic and infamous of all the pirates. But I'm here to talk about you. Uh, you and how you can become more challenging, bold, courageous, creative, innovative, fair, equal, diverse, and more pirate. Words that aren't usually associated with piracy, but that's because the troublesome truth of piracy has been glossed over by the establishment that they threatened. But it is time, my friends, to bring the truth of pirates back. And that's what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so. Hello. How are you? Thank you very much for coming. I was quite nervous. I've sat in those exact seats several times and wondered why anybody would come to speak to me. So I have dissected the book that it took me all of last year to write, that I've poured my heart and my soul in, that is about to become my new career, although I don't really know where that leads. The Godfather of Rebellion is the best line I've ever had, and I shall print up some business cards to say exactly that shortly. The point of the book is this. It's to get straight to the real challenge. How many of us are caught up in the objectives and targets that we face that are to do with this quarter or indeed this project, and they don't always ladder up to the scale of the real problem, because the scale of the real problem is this. You know, this dickhead up here, um, <laughs> this particular, I mean, not the polar bear, of course, who, who may or may not be a dickhead, who knows. Um, but the, the scale of the true challenge that we face, you know, how on earth is the, the, the potential threat of in, uh, thermonuclear war back? You know, we, we didn't even come close to dealing with 6 million people migrate across the continent of Europe. We're expecting 30 million to migrate across Europe just through the environmental crisis that we face. And we have no idea where we're going from a political point of view. These are the real challenges of our day. This is the interesting times in which we live. And if what we're doing is not in some way laddering up to a solution that might address that, then what are we doing? Are we doing the right things, or are we continuing to exacerbate the situation or accelerate the challenge that we face? This is the question I think we must ask of ourselves. These are the times we're in. And when the only certainty that we can point to, the only certainty is ongoing uncertainty, what is the skill set that's required to deal with that? What is the discipline that helps us through totally uncertain times? I think the only great mistake we could make is to continue to believe the lie that the only way of doing things is the way that they are already being done. My whole career has been spent working around young people, and I think it is a lie we perpetuate to them all the time. Why are things done this way? Because that's the way they are. I think that's one of the biggest lies we need to smash, and we need to smash it because nobody is coming to save us. No one. No one has a grand master plan. I don't know how your experience has been, but I look around, <laughs> and I do not see solace or leadership or strategy. I see a vacuum of strategy. I see a vacuum of imagination. I see a crisis of imagination at a leadership level at nearly every single one of the institutions that is supposed to have our back. I don't see rules that were made with my best interests at heart, and I do not see statues made to people who followed the rules. 
I think we need a really grown-up conversation about breaking the rules because the sense of resistance isn't enough. Now, don't get me wrong. I bloody love a Donald Trump meme as much as the next person. And if you've got a good one, send it to me and I'll share it with everyone I know. But it's not good enough. It's not going to get us out of the situation that we're in. Resistance is not enough. I'm advocating a stronger word, a much stronger word. A rebellion is what we need. And I know rebellion is a potent word, and it's a powerful word, and it's one I use with a great sense of responsibility. But I do mean a kind of sexy, cool Star Wars rebellion, by the way. I think there is a good way of approaching rebellion. I think there is a practical way of breaking some rules. I think there is a professional way of breaking some rules. But who do we look to? Who are the rule breakers? Who are the modern mutineers that get it right? Who are the radical innovators who rewrite the rules? And why, again and again, are we given Uber as the, as the example, as the benchmark, as the business model of everything, the Uberization of everything? I'll be goddamned if I'm going to give Uber as the benchmark to yet another young entrepreneur with a world-changing or world-saving idea. We have this short-term mindset that is too addicted to the notion of Silicon Valley, but I see more horseshit left behind the unicorns that come cantering out of Silicon Valley than I do chances for positivity and optimism. I think we need to widen our horizons and look further to history than the short-term view we too often have. And if we do look to history, suddenly I think we find a set of role models who are appropriate to the hour. We find the pirates. <laughs> Very glad to hear someone laugh. I, 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 I invite as much cynicism as we can possibly have, because yes, I am talking about pirates, like real pirates, and I know who you think of when I say pirates. <laughs> of course you do, and so you should. I mean, probably most of us are thinking about the kind of sexy end of Pirates, the Johnny Depp end of Pirates, the one that we've all grown up with, you know, three of the top 20 best-selling films of all time. So, of course, that's influenced our view. But it is not the whole picture. Not by a long chalk. So let me introduce you very quickly to some of my heroes of the, the Golden Age Pirates. Over here, we have Black Sam Bellamy. At 28, he was the first billionaire pirate. He was known more often as the Prince of Pirates because he was a radical enthusiast for equality, diversity, and fairness, and championing his team, who were referred to as Robin Hood's men. Up here, we've got Edward Teach, a.k.a. Blackbeard, the archetype of global pirate branding, the first one to set light to the end of his beard with sulfurous fuses to cast fear into the hearts of his enemies so that he never actually had to kill a soul, according to some historians. Over here we've got Black Caesar, one of the first pirate, black pirate leaders, but not by the only one, by a long shot. Pirates were releasing and freeing slaves hundreds of years before the abolition of slavery. And over here we have Anne Bonny, the aforementioned pirate queen, a legend among her time, a fearsome pirate leader, absolutely with full equality on the deck of a pirate ship, the only place that that kind of level of equality would have been seen in the early 1700s. And if you want an idea of how they were seen at the time, these people who were feared and revered and, and loved and hated and hotly debated, they were the front page news around the world. They were the Sandbergs and the Steve Jobs of their time because these were the unicorns of their time. This was the only place on earth that you could go and earn billions and have an amazing free lunch. In these grand new, exciting and interesting places, and new rules were being written. That's what they were. That's how they were seen because at the time, they were working class heroes. And they sit somewhere between the, the, the levelers and possibly even the suffragettes in the paradigm of, of workers' rights through to social revolutionaries. Again, I know that sounds unlikely. Uh, so let's just quickly uh, take a look at the facts. Because when it comes to fucking shit up, which is a euphemism for innovation, by the way, um, <laughs> pirates earned this moniker. They earned their right in Steve Jobs' you know, infamous quote, which, which fronts my book amazingly and still haven't gotten in any trouble for that whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Although this is beaming to the internet, so maybe now. Um, nonetheless, there is a purpose for these pirates. Every single time in economic uh, history and development, when there is market failure, when audience needs are unmet, that's when pirates come onto the horizon, because that is their positive function. They challenge evolution and innovation to do more and to be better. And in the conflict that they bring about with establishment forces, they drive it further and faster. The original pirates are a testimony to this. I'll run through these quite quickly. Global branding, we think this was Coca-Cola in and around the 1880s. Actually, it was the pirates, of course, because the first global brand that went viral, that was a meme, that delivered better profits was the skull and crossbones. Dual governance, first really seen in, in the two-house system in this country that was then taken to the States. Then we saw it in the uh, first Business Banking Act 
actually was seen on a pirate ship. The captain and the quartermaster had complete equal responsibility and power, but one was in charge of culture and one was in charge of strategy, and they did that for the exact reasons of dual governance to protect the power. Social insurance, we didn't see it until the early 1800s and eventually became an inalienable human right, of course, in 1945, but it existed on a pirate ship. Had you been wounded on a pirate ship, you were recompensed through a form of workplace compensation. Pieces of eight were awarded if you did lose an arm or a leg or indeed an eye patch. Universal suffrage, the first place on earth where every single person was given an equal vote. We think it was Athenian democracy, but of course it wasn't. Athenian democracy wasn't participative or representative. It was only the white blokes who got to vote. Until, of course, you get onto a pirate ship where every single person had an equal say. Equality of pay and transparency around pay. Oh, we can't compete on that one. We haven't even got close to it. But the pirates had it. They had a completely transparent sheet of how pay was structured on board a boat, regardless of your gender or your ethnic background. In fact, when it comes to ethnic background, pirates were diverse by design. They knew if they were going to take on the world, they had to represent the world. So they bought, built diverse teams that represented the challenges they faced. Facilitative leadership, self-organizing teams, same-sex marriage. By God. And it was a system called matulage that even had an inheritance clause in it. And if that isn't enough to convince you, my friends, pirates invented cocktails. <laughs> True say, Francis Drake. Rum, uh, some mint, um, some sugar, some limes, some mojito. <laughs> so, the need for pirates hopefully is beginning to be a little bit more established. You're believing me that this pit system of innovation took place in 30 years. I mean, there's nothing really like it other than the, perhaps the turn of the, the 19th century for all the kind of light bulbs and radium that were around. Or maybe the beginning of Silicon Valley when there was so much promise. This is one of those pronounced moments in human evolution when there is so much innovation. And there is something about the times that is so comparable to now. A, a backdrop of international ideological conflict. A, a generation facing mass redundancy through automation and kind of meaninglessness. Um, uh, a kind of tyranny of a, of a self-interested establishment that doesn't really have a handle on where to go next. You know, it sounds spookily familiar, right? And so the pirates didn't just rebel, they rewrote. They didn't just break free from society, they wrote, rewrote the rules of society. And they didn't just challenge the status quo, they changed everything. And that's why I think there is something to be drawn for this millennial audience that we, we talk so much about, yet we don't offer much in terms of leadership too the pirates could perhaps fit that mould. And when I look at the mould, this is the model that I see. Very clear, defining features. They challenge the establishment. They are creative, innovative, and disruptive. They are fiercely independent. They are led by principles, but yes, of course, they have a profit-based model, and they are highly talented, but underappreciated. These are the factors that led them to recreate and rewrite the rules of their own. And these are factors that, hopefully, many of us feel familiar with and frustrated by. Because as I look out through the book, I look back to the 21st century to find uh, modern pirates that these same framework fits to. And that the stages of pirate changes I've identified in the book are five. I start with Malala. You know, what, what better role model could we have? The, the book that you mentioned, Rowan, the, the same one that my little girl has, Scarlet. Uh, the, the, one of the first most incredible stories is this young rebel. Her act of rebellion is her act of strength. But I go on to then look at uh, examples of how we've rewritten rules, and this is happening all around us. Um, Chance the Rapper, you know, the first artist ever to win a Grammy, you know, the highest music accolade in the world, without ever releasing an album. Never actually had a record contract. You know, Snap goes the business model of the entire music industry as all the young aspiring rappers who want to be the next chance no longer pursue a, an avenue that was previously the norm, and the rules are once again rewritten. The notion of retelling, the pirates had this incredible approach to storytelling. All of the evidence that I've seen from pirate economists and historians suggests that pirates weren't the violent marauders that we think they are. They were actually incredibly savvy marketeers. And they advocated a less violent approach, not a more violent approach, because they didn't have the resources or the ability to. So they told these great fearsome tales, created the viral memes of their day, which meant that they went out to effect a surrender scenario. And in many cases, some historians would argue, saved more lives than they did to challenge. That's not to say, of course, there weren't some absolute psychos amongst them. And I'm not trying to cover off the morality of that, but I think because we've become wedded to one side of the picture, we've lost the other. The organization is so pertinent and relevant to now because pirates understood the paradox of scale. Here we are, still drunk on the hangover of the 20th century business model, where all businesses were in some way or degree based on exploitation. 60% over the, the planet's biosphere, yet totally wedded to the notion of consumerism. Screwed because all of our businesses still think the main indicator of success is one of scale. 
the pirates were able to be nimble teams, on average about 80 crew members, yet they could assemble themselves into thousands strong and sack an entire city. Not that that's necessarily a good thing to do. But they could take on the entire British Army and Navy, and here we are still unable to break free of these large organizations that hold us back and slow us down. And finally, this idea of redistributed power, because we know deep down that, that power makes a golem out of all of us. So if we're advocating new power structures and new ways of doing things, what happens when we have teams and when people do grow up and this new generation find themselves in power? How do we know they won't end up where our current leaders are? The corruption, the, the, the ineptitude, and the flaccid leadership that we face. Well, the pirates built that into their models fundamentally fair distribution of power systems. So in much the same way that Cressy Westling's in, 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 incredible business that has ended uh, Firehose being a form of landfill by turning it into luxury goods product, in exactly the same way the pirates had clear rules and guidance amongst their principles that they lived and died by that protected their notion of fairness. And this was their pirate code. It's much mentioned in the famous films and, and even in Treasure Island. Um, it's often mistaken as a set of guidelines. It was indeed a law, a, a government life or death. These are some of the re remaining uh, true historic articles. And so you will see these really interesting ideas of fair pay, how they were written down 300 years ago, of flat holocratic structures where everybody worked around a facilitative leader, of workplace compensation. I mean, there it is, actually written down. True workplace compensation 300 years ago. And the remarkable thing throughout this time is that it was never, um, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't Google pirate code, there was no wiki pirate, you know, you couldn't copy and paste from one ship to another. Yet somehow the principles were so true, so pronounced, that across 35 years, multiple crews and thousands of pirates, the wording remains almost exactly the same, pronounced and clear. So, I think there's a, an opportunity for something interesting to take place. I'm very lucky that in the process of writing this book, I went finding pirates all over the world, from the townships of South Africa to the streets of Baltimore to the center of Athens, areas where young entrepreneurs and young social entrepreneurs are propping up economies and rethinking society. I tested this material to make sure that it was authentic and valid and there was something useful in there. And by God, what I found, what I discovered, was a pirate code 2.0. Because the, the idea that we need a new system, a new, a new societal rules, actually speaks right back to this day of piracy. Whilst they created this uh, um, new framework on board their ships, they eventually exported it onto land. And not everyone is aware, but there was a proto-republic in the middle of the Caribbean, in Nassau, in the Bahamas, for more than a decade, where these pirate principles of democracy and equality and fairness actually lived in a quasi-utopia, where, where diversity and equality actually uh, are stories that then span the world at the epicenter of the slave trade, at the dawn of capitalism, uh, where, where the empires of the old world were stealing the gold of the new world, this idea of fairness began to inspire the continent above it. And those small flames eventually led to the notion of American independence. But that is another story. For now, what we need to worry about is that for a decade or so, the pirates had a fine old time in their, in, in, in their independent democratic republic. Which leads me to this idea of a pirate code 2.0. If the backdrop is so similar, if this notion of piracy is so similar, if this framework of young change makers and troublemakers is so similar, perhaps there is a pirate code 2.0. And I've been looking for ideas that sound as potent as, as perhaps 300 years ago, uh, a, a group of young people discussing the notion of fair pay, or that there might be female leaders, you know, when these were ideas were seditious. What ideas are out there now that are as big and as troublesome uh, and as potentially profound as those. And I've found some quite interesting ones. Uh, and I've begun to uh, amass a pirate code 2.0 that hopefully similarly can be shared amongst pirates. Um, there's several in the book, and these are some of the, the newer ones I've been discovering. The Fuck It Fund. There's a huge conversation about young talent, how do we keep talent in organizations. This one I found at Brompton Bicycles. To keep their young Gen Z entrepreneurial talent in the business, they have a fuck it fund. It's for relatively small amounts of money, a few thousand pounds. But if someone's actually got the, the, the gumption and the idea and the energy to make their own thing, fuck it, they say. And they give them the money to make it happen. That's how you keep your talent on board. Business plans are dead. I found this one speaking to some young social entrepreneurs in Singapore, sitting down, asking them about their business modeling processes. And they says to me, business plans, granddad? <laughs> Ouch. They do manifesto jams. They gather around a manifesto of such meaningful and pronounced purpose that it's strong enough that they can make decisions on the back of it. 
that on a tough day when they haven't seen each other for, for weeks or months, they all know the general direction of travel. And then when they do get back together, they jam their manifesto to make sure it's up to date. And of course, they've got responsive measures and metrics so they know what success looks like. But do they have a business plan that was written really to convince someone else of something that they then routinely ignore? No. Citizens, not consumers. A very interesting idea emerged from some pirates called the New Citizenship Project. Uh, we all see, I and mean, some of us are aware, we, we see this name consumer about 2,000 times a day, allegedly. It helps brainwash us into this very dangerous place. The word itself, you know, um, uh, represents the relationship that we have in a world of finite resources. What does consumerism mean other than potential suicide? Their central argument really is that advertising non-circular products should very soon be considered a war crime. But what happens if we were to think of ourselves as citizens in that matrix, in that makeup, in the world that we're living in and the relationships that we might ask for brands? The no asshole rule. I really, really, really respect this one. This is from a, 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 group, a group of young businesses that are now spread across Europe, doing incredibly well, uh, and a single unifying principle across the whole business, a thriving, profitable, successful business, is just no assholes. That's the one thing that holds them all together, and by and large, it's made this incredibly successful and vibrant place. We don't work with assholes, we don't employ assholes, we won't sell to assholes, we won't any waste any time on assholes. After that, pretty much everything is going to be all right. Seems to be working. And so I'm sharing in this book and online and everywhere I possibly can these ideas, these ideas that are beginning to replace the, the, the business model. Because time and again, I've sat in front of amazing young people with brilliant ideas to change the world, and largely they get trotted out a 120-year-old blueprint called a business plan, and they're suggested that they fill it in. And it's not appropriate for the time. It is not appropriate for the future. It does not come anywhere close to the talent, the potential, and the imagination that they represent. It is time for a new way. It is time for a code. Within all of this, the, the thing that still surprises me when I tell this story about pirates is the accountability. Pirates were one of the most accountable communities that you can come across because w these rules were set by them. So they were governed by themselves, by their peers. And in the workshops that I run, the suggestion is you find a rule, and I would encourage you all to do this today, to think of a rule, or when you experience a rule today that you really, really disagree with, that you break it fundamentally at work, out in the street, on your way home, a stupid rule, a badly made rule, a rule that was made in a rush, perhaps. You know, we know how these things happen. We've probably made up some numerous rules ourselves. A convention, a model you disagree with, and just break that fucker from the heart and see what happens, because probably you'll be fine. Probably no one's going to die. Probably you're going to feel a little bit stronger, a little bit bolder. And then you move into the next stage of piracy, and you rewrite the rule. You suggest something better. And then you tell some more people around you that I've got this better way of doing things. And before you know it, you've got one, two, three people. And that is what I'm calling a mutiny. And the workshops that I've run, when someone has broken a rule in an organization, suggested something better, and they've got some people around them to do it, they start to take it seriously. And that's the age of responsibility or the, the system of accountability that I think is getting us towards perhaps where we need to go, not waiting for answers to be handed down that we don't really necessarily even believe in, but to start to take some ownership of the problems and challenges we're in. This is not an exercise in value setting. I do not trust any organization, apologies to any of you who work in these places, that have to write honesty on the wall in three-foot letters. That is the exact embodiment of the kind of see-through values that we need to move away from, and the ownership of professional rule-breaking that I think we need to step towards. And I have taken a great step towards this. It would be completely inauthentic of me to spend so much time writing this and advocating it and then not live it myself. So in December, I left my, 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 my darling business, the liberty that I've lived and loved and set up and run for 17 years in new hands, um, and I am now finding a rule to break. And my suggestion is we find those rules to break and we make them better and we do it together. So my book came trundling off the press a few weeks ago. Um, in fact, it's about to come trundling off the press again next week. We're on the fourth edition already. It's been doing really, really well, uh, which I'm incredibly humbled by, proud of. But what's gone on before, uh, in addition to that is something I didn't expect. And I don't think any author expects anyone to turn around and actually say, oh, I quite enjoyed your book. It's a real surprise. I mean, even though I've, I've put my all into it. But I've written a book about breaking the bloody rules. So of course what was going to happen is someone started to break the rules. And this is the first email I got. I've handed in my notice, quoting back to me a line from my book. This is now one of more than 50 emails I've received. I have resigned. The responsibility could feel quite immense. But actually, I've resigned to do the right thing. I've resigned to follow my passion. I've resigned to begin something new. 
So something's occurred to me too. I'm going to try and find a way to fund my life for the rest of the year so that I can be the godfather of rebellion, so I can breathe some wind into the sails of these rebellions. Because it's not just people resigning, although I think that could potentially mean an awfully good thing. It's, it's these. You talk about pirate really inspiring to pitch for the role. People who then accelerated their careers with their project pirate presentation. It's these. I've, I've just seen the article on BA magazine. Uh, it's the campaign for real bread, that to, to teach people to make their own bread and ditch the mass-produced corporate shite available in the shops. Fucking great. Uh, thank you again for your inspiration for the book. As I said, it really helped me to think differently about the way that we've approached Apello's immigration case, from building her profile in the media to finding our crew who would support her case. And as a result, we've received coverage in two national newspapers already. As a full result of this story, actually, Apello, this young lady who'd been illegally detained, has now been released. The level of responsibility, of opportunity, of, and the power of breaking some rules and standing up to conventions is actually huge, and it's happening. The book's only been out three weeks. Now, I'm numbering more than 100 rebellions. There's 8,000 of them out already. There's another 3,000 going to print. That's quite big for book numbers. What's the rebellion rate? What's the return on rebellion that I could be trying to aim for? That's my new goal, the return on rebellion of this book. So I am advocating, uh, as the incredible young woman who helped this young lady get free, to any else who I can find to help me break some rules. And I'm going to break them too. Uh, I tried to get the book into, into Waterstones. You know, when you're a new book, it turns out the Waterstones only stop one book until they can test how that works. I don't know how you can test when you've only sold one book. It's, it's not a very good number to test on. Um, <laughs> so I popped in there to have a little look at what it might look like, you know, and just displayed some of my books, you know, where I thought they should be, <laughs> on top of Jordan Peterson, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> And then I got a bit emboldened, so I thought perhaps they'd look good in the window. Turns out they look really good in the window. Um, but then when I went back to move them around a little bit from the window, it looked a little bit like I was shoplifting. So I was rugby tackled on Piccadilly, uh, having left the display with my own books. I took it some stage further. A new book from a new author doesn't get much of a budget allocated. Luckily, I've got a brilliant team at Penguin who've given me incredible resource, but still not money for real advertising. Uh, this is the front office. This is the front of Penguin Random House on Vauxhall Bridge Road, numerous lanes of traffic. This great big window is the size of a Route Master bus. I dug back into my old club promoting days and I measured it up. Uh, it's huge. I found out how much it would cost to fly post it in bright fluorescent pink. It cost about £1,700. Uh, I was really lucky to be invited to meet Tom Weldon, the chief executive of Penguin, who's an incredible, you know, innovative uh, leader. I was asking my opinion as, a, as an entrepreneur coming in author, what, what did I think? I said, told him all my views. He said, this is great. Would you come and do a talk? I said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, but I have to charge you a fee. He said, oh, well, OK, maybe. Uh, how much? I said, £1,743. <laughs> he said, what are you going to do with that? I said, I can't tell you. <laughs> so we turned up with our high-vis vests and the, a clipboard with a fake letter from Tom and some her, her white hell hermits, and I got away with this enormous <laughs> bloody banner on the front of the offices of, of Penguin Random House. And luckily, they saw the funny side of it, because throughout that day, it got picked up in media. Eventually, Richard Branson tweeted it. We were a bestseller before the end of the day in the top hundreds, which I think was bigger than anyone expected, and, and knocking numerous heroes of mine from Simon Sinek and others out of the charts and uh, hit number one. So, you know, the power of rule breaking, the risk of rule breaking, the opportunity of rule breaking became completely clear, but I am willing to put my neck on the line. And I am willing to back others. I'm really interested in the notion of rule breaking. I genuinely mean this. We have to try something else. You know, the solutions aren't there. When I say no one is coming to save us, I don't mean to be pessimistic. I am not. I am deeply optimistic. This book is drawn from the story of thousands of young entrepreneurs that I've seen, but they're like pirates to me because they exist on the edges. They're not necessarily being listened to, but in the dark, in the freedom of the, of the liberating shadows that they're in, new ideas are forming. And the world we're in, I think that's a currency that we cannot afford to ignore. So it is time for all of us to be a little bit more pirate. Oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. <laughs> See, my children watch this on YouTube, and I'm going to be like, Mum, <laughs> you said the F word. <laughs> so I'm going to say yes, but that's because I was being more pirate along the way. So um, thank you for breaking all sorts Thanks of rules already. Um, and that was, that was a right rollicking um, run through of the history of pirates. Excellent. I do have an eye patch as well, but I just can't <laughs> see with it, but I might put it on just to, just to add. There, here we go. So, That's being more good. pirate, there you go. I respect that. Thank so, <laughs> but I actually can't really see. 
Um, and you did say we needed to have a grown-up conversation <laughs> about how to rebel um, oh, and so a professional <laughs> way to break the rules. So I'm technically breaking all of them rules of what to do when you're chairing an event at the RSA. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, yes, yes. I'm going to stick with it for a short while and then when I go to the audience, I'm definitely <laughs> taking it off. Um, but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first. So... You talked about scaling and the nimbleness mm -hmm. of this new generation. Yep. And I want to understand this kind of mutiny. I'm going to take it off too so I can actually read my question. Um, the mutiny that you're trying to, to get to, it, it has a lot of a startup start feel about yep. it. And, and I think you've definitely been working with a lot of, of startups. Um, and you also talk about never getting bigger than you are by collaborating. You know, pirates make networks. Yep. They don't scale in this kind of unicorn-type style. But I'm interested to understand, you know, what does this tell us about what business growth should look like? Have you had a conception of what the alternative is? Uh, what I do like about your, your growth, your, your rebellion, if you like, that you're trying to instill is not just break the rules but make a new one. Yep. So when you're making a new one, and you talked about profit still has to sit in there, yep. Yep. what do you see it looking like? So I, I am not anti-capitalist or, or anti-business in, in any shape of the argument, but I think that we, it's bust. This business model that we've had for over 100 years has always been based to a degree on exploitation, and it, a growth only comes through some degree of building it on somebody else. And, and that was fine. You know, globalization did many good things. It got us through the, the latter part of the 20th century with nanotechnology, the internet, I mean, you know, the Spice Girls, all manner of amazing things were, were, were born of this business model. But it's, we're out of resources, simply put. You know, we're 60% over the current biosphere of the world. So to be advertising products and that, that, that are made in a non-circular fashion that people don't really need, is akin to a war crime, I think. You know, you're, you're, you people, the, the, uh, the results are life-threatening. Growth for growth's sake, in medical terms, is cancer. So yet we still have these businesses that are just growing, that are just putting numbers on because there's some shareholders at some point through the process and we haven't understood that the profit, the small margin of profit that comes off, all of the costs that are actually facing a real world in real crisis. And we're so wedded to that model. It's so hard to break free from it. And the second you start talking about degrowth, which is, you know, there's a very good, strong case for it, um, of subsist existing businesses, of sustainable models, it begins to feel very anti-capitalist and, and radical. I, I, I think that conversation just needs to mature. Really does. The, the notion of business and the shape of business, something very interesting is also happening behind the scenes. So if we look at a really long-term trend, so not just my ideals of pirates, but 1965, the average life cycle of a business was 75 years. That's how long your average business lasted, 75 years. In 2015, the average life cycle of a business had dropped significantly to 15 years. So that's a nearly 100-year trend, so it's a re pretty reliable data set. Over the same period of time, uh, the volume of businesses in the UK had gone from a couple of hundred thousand to over five million. So what you're going to get push that forward another 10 years, say to 2025, if that same decline in business, average business life expectancy continues, you're talking about sub 10 years, maybe a seven or eight year average length of a business. It's a very short amount of time, but you're also talking about much more. You might hit nine million. So the idea that you'd have one job for one organization at once becomes increasingly unlikely. That you'll have multiple uh, feet in lots of different projects and they're overlapping and shifting and merging between one another becomes far more realistic. So to be uh, wedded to and, and, and aware of how to operate in a modular, networked, agile system feels really important and we don't have many precedents for it. What we have is lots of, lar lots of large corporates having a narrative around how do we be more entrepreneurial, how do we be more agile? But 300 years before those things were, were buzzwords, there is a system that's got a proven track record. Mm. So, so pausing on those large corporates for a second, um, I was quite taken with you dis your description of the kind of pirate model in Nassau, which must have been very nice, where they kind of prototyped um, democracy and then it, it took off yeah. elsewhere. Um, I see that kind of modern day equivalent happening a lot in terms of labs inside yeah. large organisations like the Eagle Labs at Barclays and yep. Unilever has um, a, a lot of, um, into, yeah, the foundry at Unilever. Um, 
I mean, to a certain extent, you're almost seeing that these organisations are, are, are explicitly co-opting yep. startup culture. But in your book, you talk about things like, you know, how pirate, you know, everything from pirate radio to Napster created the disruption to the status quo, yep. created the challenger business. We see that a lot now in lots of things, but then ultimately becomes iTunes. And, you know, is the rebel always destined to be co-opted by the establishment? And how do you actually change the establishment if that's the case? Yep. Uh, so I think the, the pirate change model is effectively, in the most simple terms, is you kick as hard as you can at the edges and the waves you create end up influencing the centre. That seems to be the notion. So it's a form of kind of cultural influence. So the, this, this democratic republic was legendary. I mean, it travelled the world. You can, you can read reports by, the, by the, uh, the, um, the lords of trade and they're clearly terrified of this place where you can get paid fairly and there's a sense of democracy and camaraderie and the, and the free-flowing rum. I mean, that's how they describe it, and it's in the Caribbean. I mean, it just sounds great, right? And if you're equivalent at the time back here, you know, life was brutal. You know, public execution was a, was a kind of public entertainment. You know, if you were in the Navy, chances are you didn't intend to be there. Chances are you weren't going to get paid. It was a very, very tough circumstances. So the idea of fairness and equality did become uh, incendiary ideas that took off. And gradually, over time, those ideas became so popular and powerful, they had to become absorbed and, and taken up if the, if the establishment was going to counter them. And that's the case. Each and every time. So pirate radio, yes, the, the time uh, we had two radio stations in the UK, and that had been the case. We had a complete monopoly by the BBC. Um, and two stations didn't serve the, the, the needs of the audience. And market failure. In the mid-1960s, the, the musical explosion wasn't being served. They, they sailed the boats just outside of the, the, the legal order of the UK and began to broadcast. Within two years, they had a third of the country listening to them and they were making revenue. So the BBC had to open the doors and they created Radio 1 and Radio 2. So huge cultural influence and change. And, then, and the pirate radio movement continues to, to challenge and champion and thank, good they, thank goodness they do because it brings an awful amount of creativity into the space. Right through to iTunes, the other one you mentioned, when Steve Jobs was pulled into the room by the assembled music industry in absolute fear of Napster. You know, who are these pirates taking all of our money and you know, stealing from the artists? What they were giving was a digital audience access to the music that they wanted. Market needs were failing dramatically. Jobs famously tells them the solution is iTunes. They can't get their heads around it. They do a deal which allows him to have full ownership... <laughs> Uh, and a, a plan that they should try to sell one million units within the first six months. And I think they sell six million in the first week. Um, and then iTunes owns it. Of course, Apple is no longer a pirate organization. Absolutely not. It's, it's completely the heartland of the institution and the establishment, no matter what its adverts might want to tell you. But now, on the edges, they're the new breed of pirates. And they will once again push it further forward. And that is the, the, the role that we need to celebrate and understand, that of... of, of constructive conflict that pushes innovation, that asks questions, that encourages us to, to you know, always challenge assumptions. That's how it pushes it always forward. There's something there as well, though, about how maybe the, the establishment can potentially innovate as well, or can actually embrace the concept of being um, an, a force for innovation and change. Um, I think in many instances we've seen resistance to change or upholding a status quo, so as to quell the fear of, of the unknown. But yep. as you say, uncertainty is the new certainty. Yep. We live in, in kind of polarised times. We've just released a podcast on that called Polarised, which I think goes really deeply into the, the place we are now. So this, you know, you referred to it as that, the citizen shift. Um, I think that where, where can we see democratic structures learning from this kind of... I think you described it earlier to me as a millennial mutiny... Um, what, what kind of participatory democracies, you know, could we start seeing if we start thinking a bit more pirate? I mean, I think... So, I see them everywhere now. Now I've opened my mind to them. And I, think part, I think part of that, not to get too self-help about it, but the, the first rebellion, the most important rebellion, is, is, is liberation from our own limitations. You know, the self-imposed limitations and understanding what it is we do that gets in the way and then just stepping outside. And that's why I really do advocate a healthy degree of rule-breaking to absolutely every single one of you today. You know, as much as you should eat an apple before the end of the day or you're five or, or, or get some exercise and walk, get off the bus at a step early, all those useful things that you do, building your rule-breaking muscle. Because the day is surely upon us when breaking the rules will become the right thing to do. 
know, we live in historic times. We totally know it. And we know that in history, those who broke the rules become our, our legends and our role models and our heroes. And those who were just following orders, well, we judge them very dimly. I think the time is upon us when those kind of questions will be asked of us or we'll be asking them of ourselves. Should we be following the rules when they're no longer fit for purpose and people are, are at risk? So, yes, I look out now and I, say, I see examples of this again and again. I think the, the, um, uh, the Women's March at the beginning of last year is a fine example of this. You know, it's begun in response to a political set of circumstances. Um, it was in response to the, 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 the nat nature of some of the comments made. And before you know it, a few small hubs of social media uh, outrage became a very well organized and then the largest mobilized civil demonstration in history. You know, absolutely, totally outside of convention in response to um, a political reality. I see it uh, in, in Thailand. You, can, you take this all the way through, the, the Sunflower Revolution in Thailand. Um, uh, recent, relatively recent democracy, about 20 years, you know, with the grand history of being very undemocratic, a group of young millennials led by an incredible woman called Audrey Tang. Um, uh, decided that they should enter into a system of participative budget setting, not just top-down budget setting. So they forked the main government website, which means they, they made a URL that looked a lot like the government website, so the traffic went to a place which said, hey, this is the budget that we're currently setting. Where do you think it should be sent? And the largest ever to that time exercise in participatory budget setting took place. She's now the digital minister um, for the country, and they are now rated number one in terms of transparency around the world. But Canada are playing with it, Australia are playing with it. Macron got to power. You know, he, he made his entire um, uh, manifesto through 350,000 participatory uh, data points. So there's a lot of examples of it being incredibly successful. And the, the question is more so, in my mind, why aren't we updating our other systems? You know, there's so many parts of our life where we're used to and, and we expect a level of technology and a, and a level of responsiveness, yet it fails us in other areas. It fails us in youth work, it fails us in education, it fails us in, in politics. If the level of systematic failure that we see, for example, in education, uh, you know, running at such a, a, an out-of-kilter pace with the rest of uh, technology and economic advancement, where else would you accept, where else would you tolerate that? You wouldn't tolerate it if you're, you know, iPhone only ever ran at 50% of the pace of the rest of the world would be an outrage. Uh, yet it takes place in other areas of our lives, and, and, and it's, it's those areas of, of mutiny. That's what I'm deeply suggesting that we need to start getting constructively angry about, that the practical and professional sense of rebellion that requires action. And I take it right the way through to the big organizations, because yes, absolutely, a lot of my inspiration comes from startup culture that I've been in, but like I say, I took this on the, on the road to develop it, to make sure that it was as useful as it could be. And probably the biggest pushback I got from audiences was, great, but I'm not a pirate. I work in a large organization. I want some of these principles, but I don't want to lose my job. So those ideas is, is really some of the most exciting ones that I've seen. Um, you know, incredible uh, young wannabe pirates, really deeply frustrated with corporate culture, who want to make a difference, who then begin a mutiny within not just one organization, but multiple organizations. And I've seen it from you know, challenging uh, young creatives who wanted to challenge a big brief they knew that was coming down from one of the la world's largest energy companies. Together, they span some of the largest media companies in London. Collectively, their opportunity to reject a brief, to demonstrate this mid-tier of talent doesn't want to work on that kind of project, when it moves together, they can't shoot us all right, uh, is incredibly strong. But I've seen it go right through to meeting culture. Um, one mutiny group that we ran, just furious about the way the meetings were run, that the young people get spoken over, that it's always blokes pontificating, that there's no, it's just a waste of time. So they wrote their new meeting manifesto and agreed that if a meeting wasn't well run, they would stand up and walk out. You know, the threat was amazing, but enough of them willing to do it. What, the effect of that is that meetings start to be well run. So I don't mind where the level of rebellion is. And like I said, I advocate a, a, daily bit of, a daily dose of rule breaking because not everybody is going to be the story of, of Aleppo. Some of them is just going to change the way my organisation works. To build your pirate muscle. But pirate for good, I think, is what we need to keep going for. Rather it's than the rewriting kind of, of the rules. That's exactly the moment when this really began to make sense for me because there are pirates throughout history and we're not talking here about Somali pirates or Chinese pirates or, or a number of different pirates. We're talking about the golden age of pirates where the, the millennials of the 18th century, frustrated by a broken system, rewrote the rules of society. It's that act of rewriting them that I think we've got much to learn from. Great. Can I come to the audience, lady in the front first, and then keep your hands up and I'll come to you. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, 
my name is Geetha, um, and Geetha. I've very much enjoyed your your talk. Uh, just like you know, it's like the crazy ones, the Steve Jobs advert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just sounded like that. So, a um, couple of things. Um, we don't buy from Amazon ever, so slightly disappointed to see that you were delighted with hitting number one on Amazon because that's kind of a rule. So I'd like to ask you, I've got a book with me that I've written, yep. and I'd like to swap it with the book of yours and not pay you for the book until I decide what it's worth. See, that's you what up for that? Very good. I'm totally down with that. Um, <laughs> totally. Uh, and anyone else who's got any, I've got a bag of books. <laughs> Penguin are going to stop loving you quite so much. I don't know. Um, <laughs> So the thing that I was told that I couldn't do was, as an author, you're allowed to buy your books at a certain price, half price. Why not tell you the truth? Um, but if I sell any books, they don't count to book sales. So for us as authors, right, you, you, you make such a small money on, you make about 10% of the book sales. So it sells for £10, I might get less than a quid. And then usually Amazon sell it for much less, so you get much less. So there's no chance of being able to fund the rebellions that I want to do by doing that. So for me, actually, hitting bestseller is really important for another reason, because it then gives me more chances for more platforms to then hopefully be able to cross-subsidise. But if I can get to a place where I can actually make a rebellion fund, you know, this is where my, my thinking is at. So it is important to play the game, and the pirates certainly played the game. You know, they, they challenged the Navy, they stole from the Navy, they did what they can, and the, stuff that, the games that I'm having, hopefully, with, with Waterstones and Amazon are with some degree of respect, but hopefully you know, challenging and, 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 and provocating as well. The um, thing I was mainly told that I couldn't do is, is it was become a bookseller. So I've worked very hard to, to make part of my website a, a bookseller. So I've put the best books that helped inspire me to write Be More Pirate, and I'm selling them alongside my book, which now means legally I can be entitled as a bookseller. So the books that I do sell can count towards overall sales units. So if you go to bemorepirate.com, you have an option. It says, buy here from Amazon if convenience and cardboard is important to you, <laughs> or if you prefer people who pay your taxes, you can buy directly from me. <laughs> There you go. So there's some in there. There was a lady in the, uh, the, the back there, and then we will go to this side for the U2. U2. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask um, if you could talk a bit about how you go from the initial mutiny, the awareness raising campaign, we'll hit on Me Too for the sake of argument, um, to coming up with solutions, because you've obviously discovered a whole load of people who are talking about solu finding solutions to yep. things. So how does it come from you know, a big movement that everyone thinks is catchy to something that translates into, in, into something real that changes something? Um, it's a very good practical question, and I think the, the answer is momentum. So it's bending some rules, firstly. Why are we doing it like this? Why are we doing it like this? Then you push and you push and you push, and then you realise you're just doing it like this because somebody thought it was a good idea some while ago. You know, we've, most of us have all been in organisations. You all had that feeling, right, when you meet the people in charge. You're like, really? <laughs> and then you, you, know, you get to another organisation, then you meet the next set of people in charge. You're like, what? And then one day you might meet like, someone in government, you get to the top of those organisations, and you're like, what? Uh, you know, I found that you know, a few times I was invited to number 10, you're waiting for the... The, the secret cupboard of ninjas who really know what they're doing. And actually, what you discover is most of the rules that we follow were worked out by some blokes, you know, on a deadline, without th completely thinking it through, and then you, before you know it, that got signed off. Rarely has the rules that we follow been really deeply thought through for all of our collective benefit. That's not to discredit, like, the, the wonders of the civil service or infrastructure in other areas. But by God, I think quite a lot of the stuff that we've put up with isn't necessarily fit for purpose and hasn't fully been thought through and deserves a bit of a challenge. So with that notion in mind... The beta testing stage, you know, how could we do this better? How could this better suit me? How this, might this suit someone else? Just to let that become a natural question, you know, just constantly challenging the first assumptions. Why, why is it like this and how could it be done differently? That, I think, is just a healthy first state. And it might be that you ask all the questions and actually the way it is makes sense. But in that beta space, at the edges, when you start kicking things around, when you, when you play with them, you know, the reason why so many organisations have made labs is to try and, and, and infect that space with a bit of imagination and creativity. The thing that makes the difference is momentum. So you need to, you need to you know, literally raise the flag and see who wants to follow this idea. You know, that, that, that meeting example earlier on, that would have completely died if it didn't connect with the feeling that everyone else had. One that consistently comes up when I've run it is about um, uh, the, the, the time at which we all start work. You know, a, a generation totally thinks it's ridiculous that we all should turn up at a certain hour and be governed by different hours when our working day is elongated through digital technology. This is crazy. And particularly if you've come from university where you're treated like a grown-up, you're given a goal that you have to achieve and it's up to you how you get there, and suddenly you know, the, the pressure's on to sit in this desk for a certain amount of time. It's, it's crazy. 
And what seems to happen when you push back on these rules is they yield. The ones that weren't, weren't good or right for you disappear. You replace them with something else. And then it's about that small group that follow you. And if they don't, you keep developing. You keep pushing at it. Um, one of the ones I talk about in the book that's one of my, my, my favorite all-time rule-breaking notions is uh, a music-loving couple frustrated with Simon Cowell's dominance of the charts every single year, um, realizing that Simon Cowell is once again again be, going to be number one. They thought, God, you know, I've had enough of this. And so they decided that the, the most anti-Simon Cowell record they could find, and they just started a Facebook campaign to against, rage against the machines, uh, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, to Christmas number one, because it really made them laugh. Uh, but they tested it. They found safe spaces to test it, and community forums tested it, and the right music sites to go and test it in. And you know what? People began to follow that rebellion. It could have stopped there and then. It could have just made them laugh one evening. But they built, and they built, and they built. And I think that that is the notion of good ideas. I think that imagination compounds in exactly the same way that money does. So you take that notion that you've been tested, you put it into various areas, and before you know it, You've beaten Simon Cowell off the Christmas number one with a song with a great big F-bomb in the middle of it, which is exactly what they did. Gentleman there and then the gentleman in the front. In the Hi, second um, from the I, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, including the bad language. Um, you several times used the phrase um, young entrepreneurs, and you talked about millennials a lot. Yes. Um, I'd love to be a young entrepreneur, but I've missed my chance, I'm afraid. I, I'm, I do get the, the impression that your book is aimed mainly at young people, yep. which is fine. That's where the change is going to come from, broadly. Yep. But there's a lot of old farts like me who you know, would love to be able to contribute to this. Um, how do we build some sort of maybe cross-generational yeah. ideas? You know, the people, you know, people who are retired toward the end yep. of their careers have got lots of ideas, lots of energy. Um, I don't feel that I'm being addressed by your book, in a sense. I'm, I'm not part of that audience. Um, was that your intention in writing the book? Or... What's your name, please, sir? My name's Clive. Hello, Clive. Uh, I think that's a really, really good question, a really important question, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, my book is principally aimed at, at that generation, yes. It's why it has the cover it does. It's why the people at Penguin backed me to not be hardback first, to make it like 15, to, it's 9 dollars you know, it's, it's very, you know, I, I work with a platform so that it's available for free, you know, a, a synopsis version of it in, one week after launch. That's really, really important to me. Um, this is a generation that viewed as the, the, not, a, not a core book buying audience. The, the, the notion that radical ideas held in books, A, is the fundamental reasons upon which Penguin was built, but it's so important and is so important now. And I, and I don't think that conversation is having it, happening uh, at that level as much as it should do. I think they're routinely patronized. I think it's a generation that's been missold its own future and it doesn't have access to opportunities that previous one did. And I think that needs balancing out. So that's why I'm staunchly. Um, in defense and in service to that generation. However, there is a second audience to my book, and it's really important, is you, Clive, absolutely. Um, and me too, I'm 42 now, so I'm definitely not young. Uh, and I think we do have a role to play. It is totally intergenerational, but we have to accept there is something different. Every generation wants to rebel against the last, and every generation of pirates becomes you know, the norm of the next. But something has shifted, and I've worked day in, day out with young people. I'm very lucky to have done so. And I joked for many years that when I was 40, I'd be too old to run Liberty, because that's because I was young, and I 40 felt like it would never happen. And then it turned 40, and it turned out it wasn't a joke. Um, but the last three years of my time at Liberty, something profoundly different uh, was, was, was clear about this generation of young people. And it wasn't just the natural um, rites of passage to rebel. It was the... It was the opportunity and the sensibility of potential. And I think my view is that this is Maslow level. So you know this notion of Maslow that over time we all get to a certain point when we, we can self-articulate. The, the simplified version is it's not until we've got the food and shelter that we can go and get jobs and life that then eventually we've made some money and then we give back. I perceive a generation who is not waiting to give back. They're not going to take in the first place. They are not going to accept the kind of business models that we grew up and fought our way through to then get to the top so then they can be benevolent back to a community. They will refuse to build things in that way. And I've worked with young people in rural areas and urban areas, educated and completely on the fringes. And this sense of commitment, a dedication to a more positive philosophy of, of being of benefit and service to their community, whether that's their street or the world, their sense of ambition and scope and, and understanding and awareness of the change that's required is frankly phenomenal and causes me deep optimism. 
And, and every single time I try and test it, I'm proven right. Find, I mean, let's do, who are the 20 somethings in the room? Okay, Seriously, so not too many of them. <laughs> so is there a 20 something in the room who doesn't have some kind of side hustle on the go outside of their main day to day occupation? No, they don't, they don't exist. Thank you very much. It's a live test. No, you won't find them. So there is something going on. And I think it's to do with the, um, you know, we evolve as humans based on our circumstances. That's why we, you know, we've still got nipples and, and eyebrows and the rest of it. This is a generation who've evolved with a with the level of information at their fingertips th that's a superpower. You know, so their, 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 their view on the world is affected by it. And this has never happened before. And I think it's... It's so potentially powerful and so dangerous to be wasted. And so I think the message to our generation is to learn to gracefully lean out. You know, this is a moment to use the emotional intelligence and the leadership and all the knowledge and experience that you only get through the battle scars that you and I have got, you know, the, the, the instinct, but to demonstrate the, the respect to a generation who is more technologically advanced than us. Whose, whose view isn't governed by left-right politics, it's, it's, it's governed by international versus national mindset. You know, it's an evolving generation, and I think it deserves a shot. And I don't think we deserve having to wait another generation of, you know, latent 20th century thinking until things get better. And bottom line, could they do a worse job? So, we have one more question. I, I think I've given someone the microphone, and I'm, I'm really sorry, but we're running over, so that's going to have to be our last question. Gentleman Hi, there. Yeah, Andrew Armour, I'm a, um, I'm a fellow of the RSA, and I work in innovation. Just as um, the maverick thinking, um, it's not a new concept. I was taught it at university in the 1990s by Tom Peters and things. But the problem that I would like to, you to talk about is the differentiation in terms of this maverick thinking and breaking rules, because breaking rules led to things like Enron, it led to things like Uber. It did lead to things like Airbnb. And there's some real issues there because the people in those organizations call themselves mavericks. They think they're breaking rules to pay tax offshore. So I just want to see how you're differentiating between positive piracies uh, uh, versus people who are just breaking the rules. For, and they will call themselves mavericks. Is that laws, not rules, though? There's a, but over to you. Last question. Uh, this is a great question. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it takes me so long to answer them. I haven't <laughs> left enough time. Um, So I've got a real problem with some of those, actually. Um, I think that you know, Airbnb and Uber and you know, the, the, the ideas that you mentioned, you know, the promise there was, what do we call it, the, the sharing economy. You know, what bollocks was that? You know, it was just uh, innovation in further exploitation. It's the same business model, but for different people to exploit, exploit, but new technology that will allow me to exploit more people you know, in more intelligent and sophisticated ways. Um, the promise was really short-lived. You know, Google have just dropped their don't be evil line, haven't they? Um, the technology will save us is such a misleading ideal. I, I, so all of those examples I, I think we need to really watch, watch out for, firstly, and that the, we default to Silicon Valley as the, um, the benchmark of innovation and creativity is da dangerous, frankly. And, and like I said, as much horseshit as there are good unicorns. Um, so my definition of pirates, what, what's really caught my eye about this, and I, I mean this very specific golden age of piracy, is they're not just rule breaking, they're rewriting them. So the stratified system of the Navy where they were unlikely to be paid and likely to be bullied, they created a system where everybody had a vote over the captain's continuancy. So if the captain, if there's any chance of power corrupting the captain, everybody could vote them out. Now imagine that, imagine the accountability, I don't know, who can vote their boss out at any moment? Do you have that clause? Can, you, can <laughs> not, your team not vote you out at any moment? <laughs> Would it keep you on your toes? Oh, I'm kept on my toes oh. all anyway by my team. You know, the, if, any, if, if there was any theft on board a pirate ship, you, uh, and some of the codes, you would have your ears and nose slit and be left on a sandbank. You know, apply that to the banking industry. So <laughs> there are these really interesting systems where as much as there is, you know, what seems by through, you know, the lens of moral relativism pretty tough, there is distinct accountability and absolute transparent fairness. At the height of the financial crisis, the, the, the ratio between the highest and low, the lowest paid people was part of a lot of the conversations, you know, as, as an indicator of how out of kilter we've got. 
On a pirate ship, it was usually never more than a degree of about six times ratio. So the captain would have six times the lowest paid person. But this was all agreed before they set sail on the adventure. So you say, no, that's, that's not good for me. It's, so there's transparency, there's forced fairness. It's, it's written in a set of principles that everybody collectively agrees before you go out and, and responsibility is shared. So I don't think it's just about breaking rules. I think it's about rewriting rules. I don't think it's, it's, it's good enough to just go, hmm, that's the terrible way we've done something. Here's a nice technology overlay. Now we'll just do it even more terribly. Um, and I don't think it's okay to build models that aren't fair. You know, for, a, for a deeply unfair world, we have to rebalance this. And in all of their systems, fairness was, 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 was absolutely fought for and forced into it. Thank you. I know there's lots of people who would like to talk more with Sam, and I think Sam's going to be outside signing some of his books and maybe swapping them and, yeah, and all sorts of... What, however you want to rebel, running, so you have your say. moment when, when he's out there, um, out there later. Um, I'm, I've just loved all of this. It's been fabulous. Um, I'm minded of actually that you can rebel within systems as well because I had an Uber driver who didn't charge me because the app broke and he, we, couldn't, we couldn't pay. And he said, you know what? Life is more than money. Did you see the bus drivers in Japan? No. So they're, 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 all day, but they're, yes. going, on, they're going on strike uh, but not stopping. So they're, they're not taking their pay. Uh, so there's a huge demonstration, but they're continuing to keep the buses moving so that it doesn't stop the city. So there's a, there's a kind of morality under the rebellion. I'm loving that. That's, that kind of gives sense to the godfather of rebellion moniker that is now yours <laughs> forever. Um, but many thanks to you, uh, our audience in the room and online, for this fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, as I say, Sam will be uh, signing some books outside in the foyer. But before you dash off to do that, please give a final big hand to our fantastic speaker, Sam Conifello. <laughs>